Good evening. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. My name is Peter Casarello, um, Associate Professor in the Department of Theology, and since uh, 2013 it's been my privilege to serve together with colleagues in the World Religions, World Church area of theology. And uh, it's been a great privilege also to put together this conference on finding the beauty of the other. It's a particular privilege to introduce John Allen as our opening plenary speaker for our conference. He's been a trusted colleague of mine since 2008, when I first began to organize events in Chicago, before coming to Notre Dame, on world Catholicism. Uh, the study of global Catholicism, I think, would be helped if we had some kind of bat signal that we could send out over Gotham City to John and his wife every time that we're planning a large international gathering on world Catholicism. John Allen is associate editor of Globe and Crux, of the, of the Boston Globe and of Crux, the Globe's website covering Catholicism. He's a senior Vatican an analyst for CNN and was a correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter for 16 years. 16 years. He's an author of, by my last count, 10 books, the most recent of which include The Francis Miracle, 2015, Against the Tide, The Radical Leadership of Pope Francis, 2014, 10 Things Pope Francis Wants You to Know, 2013, very important book, The Global War on Christians, from 2013, and my favorite, which I highly recommend for classroom use, actually, The Future Church, How 10 Trends Are Revolutionizing the Catholic Church. As you can see, the range of John's journalistic expertise is simply vast. He has access to and has earned the trust of tap, top Vatican sources like no one else this side of Buenos Aires. <laughs> Most of all, that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> Most of all, I'm always impressed and uplifted not only by his scoops, uh, but even more so by his unfailing equilibrium. In a world and in a church where polarization threatens to become the norm, John Allen has always been a figure whom partisans on all sides can agree is a voice that desperately needs to be heard and heeded. Please join me in welcoming back to Notre Dame, Mr. John Allen. Thank you. Hello there. Hello. Can everyone hear? Yes. Outstanding. Uh, well, listen, it is uh, obviously a, a thrill to be here tonight and an honor. Uh, I am doubly honored today because I think I may have pulled off the ultimate American Catholic double play today. Uh, I spoke this morning at Georgetown, and here I am tonight at Notre Dame. <laughs> I leave it to you to decide which of those two is the greater honor. Uh, but uh, but uh, in any event, it's great to be here, not simply because it gives me a chance to be at Notre Dame, because it also uh, gives me a chance to connect with so many old friends uh, who are among you uh, here tonight, uh, who have been, uh, in various ways, important and instrumental uh, in my career over the years. So without going into a laundry list of who you are and what you've done, just please know from the bottom of my heart to all of you, thank you. Uh, it, let me say this. Uh, Peter's uh, introduction that you just heard a moment ago was uh, extremely generous, so much so, Peter, uh, that I found it mildly embarrassing, sort of borderline, you know, elegiac. Uh, and so I feel the need to issue just a, a, a very small correction. Not so much a correction, just a bit of gloss. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, it is true, as Peter just told you, uh, that I am CNN's senior Vatican analyst. But I can think of two very good reasons why no person in this room should be impressed with that. Okay? Let's begin with this. First of all, in addition to being to CNN's senior Vatican analyst, I am also their only Vatican analyst. <laughs> uh, so I am senior in the universe of one. This is what network television does. Rather than giving you more money, they give you loftier titles. Okay? It's a bit like, I don't know, the Academy or the Catholic Church <laughs> in that regard. Um, uh, the other reason no one uh, should be impressed more substantively is this. I, I don't know if you people have noticed this, but I am constantly astonished by how little you actually have to know about a subject 
in order to qualify as an expert on that subject on American TV. <laughs> Have you ever noticed this? It really is astonishing. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story to illustrate the point. This goes all the way back to April 2002. Uh, this was the white hot period of the sexual abuse crisis in the American church, right? Uh, and at one point during all of that, uh, the news broke that Pope, uh, the Pope, who at that time, of course, was uh, John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, uh, was going to call all of the American cardinals to Rome for a kind of extraordinary 48-hour summit. Now, when that story broke, uh, I was actually in Chicago. I was not in Rome. Uh, I had been asked to give a, a talk at Loyola Chicago that night, that morning. Uh, I had been asked to go by the offices of U.S. Catholic Magazine and kind of give them a Vatican 101 briefing. So all morning, uh, I was, you know, around this table having a conversation with people. And, you know, I think we broke at around 11 o'clock. Uh, and I came out and turned on my cell phone, and there were like 97 messages. Uh, and before I could even uh, check the messages, I got a panicked phone call from a CNN producer in Atlanta saying, John, John, what do you know about this story that the Pope is calling all of the American cardinals to Rome? And I said, well, look, I mean, first of all, I'm not in Rome. I'm in Chicago. And secondly, despite what you may think, I am not in telekinetic contact with Vatican officials. You know, honestly, I don't know anything about this story. I've got nothing. Zero. Zip. Nada. This person's answer, and this is a direct, literal quote, the answer was, that's great, let's go live. <laughs> <laughs> and we did! Um, and for the next 10 minutes, I proceeded to tease out the implications of this thing I had just heard about like 30 seconds before. <laughs> now, uh, I hope the Jesuits in the room will forgive me if I say uh, I indulged in a little bit of Jesuitical self-justification, saying that had it not been me, it would have been someone who knew even less, and so I was, you know, preventing a greater harm. Uh, but uh, in any event, all this, ladies and gentlemen, is why you should not be terribly impressed that I am CNN Senior Vatican Analyst. Look, uh, I have been asked to talk to you tonight about uh, the beauty of the other uh, and relationships uh, among different religious traditions. Let me begin by saying, with all due respect to my dear friend Peter, whose work uh, I admire enormously, that this is in some ways a curious choice to invite a journalist to come in to talk to you about beauty. Because let's face it, journalism is not really a profession renowned for its keen aesthetic sensibility. Okay, I mean, my wife would be the first one to tell you that all of my taste is in my mouth, okay? Uh, however, however, the good news for you here tonight uh, is that I'm not gonna be trotting out my own perspectives uh, on the beauty uh, of interfaith relationships. Uh, instead, I have the advantage of being able to talk to you about the public figure that I cover on a daily basis, uh, and that is Pope Francis. Uh, and the way Pope Francis uh, would understand uh, the beauty of interfaith relationships. Uh, and so what I want to submit to you here tonight, uh, the fundamental thesis for the presentation is going to be that for Pope Francis, relationships with the other, whether that other be someone from a different Christian tradition, whether that other be someone from a different religious tradition, uh, someone from a different ideological tradition, uh, a different geographic experience, Whatever. Uh, I think uh, it, it is clear to me, having covered the man day in and day out since his election on March 13th, 2013, that at bottom, his commitment to this, uh, this philosophy of outreach, dialogue, and engagement is fundamentally rooted in a perception of beauty, the beauty of relationship. Now, to be clear, okay, that's not all it's about. Okay, I, th I think the, the Pope would say uh, that when it comes, for example, to engaging the Christian other, there is a clear scriptural imperative. The final priestly prayer of Christ on earth was that all of his followers may be one, reflected, of course, in the encyclical of John Paul's famous 1995 encyclical on ecumenism, Ut Unum Sent. Uh, I think uh, the, the Holy Father would also say that there is a clear strategic logic these days. We live in a world in the early 21st century uh, in which religious intolerance, religious bigotry, religious extremism, and religious violence uh, is arguably the single most destabilizing force on the global stage. It is a clear threat to peace. It is a clear threat to coexistence. And therefore, 
any mainstream religious leader who retreated from engaging the other would be guilty of serious irresponsibility. And I think the Holy Father acknowledges that. However, at bottom, at bottom, I am convinced that what is fun, most fundamental for Francis is that he, when he looks upon division, when he looks upon violence, when he looks upon disharmony, when he looks upon a refusal to engage the other, fundamentally what he sees is ugliness. Ugliness. I do think there is an aesthetic dimension to his sensibility about this. Let us not forget uh, that Pope Francis, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, is very well versed in the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar. I mean, remember, he wanted to write his doctoral dissertation on Romano Guardini. He knows the German theological tradition very well. Uh, he has cited von Balthasar on multiple occasions. And those of you who know von Balthasar know that the fundamental claim uh, of his legendary three-volume work on theological aesthetics is that if something is distant from beauty, it is also distant from truth, right? That ugliness betrays, reveals, suggests, indicates a lie, okay? A fundamental piece of dishonesty. Uh, and I think Francis, when he looks at the ugliness of division, of religious conflict, of persecution, that he sees embedded in that ugliness, he sees an indicator about a deep theological truth, which is that God has called us to be in relationship. Uh, and so I think the, one of the, the, the pillars of his papacy, one of the driving forces uh, of, uh, of his outlook uh, is this desire to engage the other and all of the, the, the different flavors of the other that are out there to engage them in relationship and dialogue. I want to suggest to you tonight that that outreach, and this is the heart of the, the talk I want to give you, I want to suggest to you that the heart of the Pope's commitment to interfaith relationships and to relationships with the other in general is rooted in three basic substantive nouns, three basic qualities. Um, and I, I've chosen these three nouns because they are the three substantive nouns that the Pope has used most frequently since his election. <clears throat> you know, I'm one of those journalists that keeps an MS Word file with every word the Pope has spoken since he's been elected, uh, which is now running into the several hundred thousands of words, and so I can do keyword searches. Uh, and I can tell you that the three most common substantive nouns that Francis has used since his election are, in order, mercy, friendship, and joy. Mercy, friendship, and joy. And I think for him, the beauty of engaging the other is expressed uh, in those three ideas. Let's begin with mercy. It is abundantly clear that mercy is the spiritual Rosetta Stone for understanding this pope. It is the hermeneutic key to unlocking uh, his view uh, of who he is and what he is about. Mercy, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is his motto. Literally, this is not a metaphor. Okay? His motto as Pope is the same motto he had for 15 years as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires in Argentina, is miserando atque elegendo. That's a phrase that comes from a homily of the Venerable Bede about the gospel scene of the call of Matthew. It's a little difficult to translate into English, but basically what it means is choosing through the eyes of mercy making decisions on the basis of mercy. Mercy was in his first homily as pope, which he chose to deliver not in the magnificent setting of St. Peter's Basilica, but instead in the far more modest setting of the parish church of St. Anne's, uh, which is the, 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 the working parish church within Vatican grounds for the worker bees, the personnel who work for the Vatican. The Sunday after his election, he stood there with no notes, no prepared text, uh, and he said to the people uh, gathered in St. Anne's, I hope you will forgive me. I hope the theologians in this room will forgive me if I say that, in my opinion, the strongest message of the Lord is mercy. The strongest message, message of the Lord is mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, I have now covered three popes in my career. I have covered John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis. They have all been complex men who could not be boiled down to handy-dandy little sound bites. But having said that, let me boil down each man to a handy dandy little soundbite. Because I think each pope had a kind of signature phrase that summed up a great deal of what they were about. With John Paul, it's abundantly clear what that signature phrase was. It was, be not afraid. 
Be not afraid, the Latin version of which is Duke in Altum, set out into the deep. You know, John, John Paul was this sort of, almost the John Wayne of contemporary popes, right? This is sort of swaggering, swashbuckling man's man of a pope who wanted to sort of, you know, awaken Catholicism from its dogmatic slumber and, and sort of get it off the mat and back into the game, change the history of the world in the here and now. With Benedict XVI, again, we do not have to speculate about what the signature phrase was, said something he said over and over again, faith and reason. Faith and reason, that was the fundamental claim that Benedict was trying to present to the world during the eight years of a very difficult papacy, that human reason shorn of religious faith becomes skepticism and nihilism, that faith shorn of reason becomes extremism and fundamentalism, that to be healthy, these two things need each other. Uh, if you'll excuse the egg-headed phrase, but it is Benedict we're talking about, uh, he would say these two things are symbiotically codependent. Okay. Now, it's a little bit early in the game of the Francis, but I, but I think we already know what his signature phrase is because it is something he has said over and over and over again. So often it probably ought to be printed on T-shirts and bumper stickers as the epigrammatic motto of this papacy. And the phrase is, the Lord never tires of forgiving. The Lord never tires of forgiving. And sometimes he adds, it is we who get tired of, ad, of asking for forgiveness. Fundamentally, it is a message of mercy. And by the way, the Holy Father's commitment to mercy is not embedded just in his rhetoric. It's also embedded in his actions. Uh, one way you can glimpse that uh, is his deep commitment to the sacrament of, uh, of confession. <clears throat> to tell you a quick story to illustrate the point, uh, I presume most of you in this room, if not everyone in this room, knows that the Pope is also the Bishop of Rome, right? Which means he's the Bishop of the local diocese in Rome. Uh, and popes try to take that responsibility seriously, and one of the ways they try to show that is by getting around and making parish visits. There are about <clears throat> 300 working parishes in Rome. Uh, John Paul got to almost 200 of them. Uh, Francis so far has made 17 of these parish visits. His very first one uh, was on May 24th, 2013, uh, when he went out to the parish church of St. Elizabeth and Zechariah, uh, which is located in the Porta Pia neighborhood of Rome. If you know that, it's kind of up in the northern outskirts, and it's kind of a working-class neighborhood. Uh, I happened to be in Rome the day he was making this visit, so I decided I would go out. Uh, and I called in advance, talked to the pastor, who is a Romanian immigrant by the name of Father Bayoni Andres. Everybody there calls him Padre Ben. Uh, and I said, hey, can I come out and just sort of hang out, you know, and see what happens? He said, sure, 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 come out. So... That morning, I went out, and the Pope was scheduled to get there at 10.30 in the morning. Okay? Now, at around 9.30 or so, <clears throat> we are sitting in Father Ben's very modest office, drinking coffee, and we start to hear the rotor wash of a helicopter. Right? And initially, we're thinking, well, this is the Carabinieri. That's the Italian kind of paramilitary police. We're thinking they're just doing a flyover to make sure the security situation is copacetic. Right? But the thump, 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 you know, starts getting louder and louder and louder. And eventually we realize, oh, my God, this is the papal helicopter. Okay. The Pope was showing up like 45 minutes early. Okay. Now, uh, after I got the defibrillator and restarted Father Ben's heart, <laughs> um, you know, he got up uh, off the floor and ran out to the parking lot where they had set up this makeshift helipad, you know, where the helicopter was going to land. Uh, and it touches down, and, and Francis pops out uh, and says to him, look, I am really sorry for the early start, um, but uh, in addition to saying mass and meeting with the people and all of that, uh, I would really like to hear some confessions. Okay? Now, bear in mind, this was not part of the plan. Okay? This was not part of the official program. So Father Ben basically ran and grabbed eight people totally at random <laughs> and said to them, you're going to confession. <laughs> and I was there. It was so cute because one of these guys said, well, Father, that's very nice, but I don't want to lose my spot in line to see the Pope. And he said, oh, believe me, you're going to see the Pope. <laughs> you know? So he brought these guys into the church, and they, guys and gals, men and women, they lined up uh, in front of the confessional, and one by one, Francis sat there, 
heard their sins and administered God's forgiveness. Now, in part, this was just him being a good bishop of Rome, right? But in part, it was him wanting to make a point. He wanted the world to see the leader of the Catholic Church taking time to celebrate the church's premier right of mercy. Premier right of mercy. I mean, when we were with the Holy Father coming back from Brazil in July 2013, when he went there for World Youth Day, it was the very first of these famous airborne press conferences he's done. You all know this, right? That unlike previous popes, Francis has now adopted the custom at the end of one of his foreign trips. He will come on the return flight back to Rome. He will come back. And usually for an hour or more, he will stand there and take questions on any topic under the sun, totally unfiltered, totally unscripted. It's evening at the improv with the pope. Okay, uh, and answer absolutely anything you ask him, which, which has led me to say, think about flying on the papal plane. Uh, in many ways, uh, it is nothing to write home about. The food is bad, the seats are uncomfortable, but ladies and gentlemen, the in-flight entertainment is spectacular. <laughs> okay. Anyway, the very first occasion he did that, one of the questions we asked Francis uh, was about uh, pastoral care for divorced and remarried Catholics. And he answered our question, but then he said, I would like to go on to make a broader point. He said, I believe that the present, by which he meant his papacy, said, I believe that this is a kairos of mercy. A kairos of mercy, using that evocative Greek New Testament word that means a privileged moment in God's plan of salvation. This is a pope who believes that he was put upon the throne of Peter in the first instance to dust off and lift up the gospel of mercy and make it resplendent once again for the wider world. Now, look, uh, you know, he's no naive. I mean, he understands as a Christian pastor, he is obligated to do two things with regard to a fallen world. He has to, re he has to pronounce both God's judgment and also God's mercy, that one without the other would be a falsification. But I think his calculus is that the world has heard our judgment with crystal clarity, and now it is time for them to hear and to see, and to feel, and to smell, and to taste our mercy. If you want my prediction, and I know no one in this room has asked for it, but I am legendary for answering questions I've never been asked. Uh, here we go. If you want my prediction, at the end of the day, I believe Francis will be remembered as the Pope of Mercy. I think that's how we will think of him. Uh, and the fact, of course, that he has decreed a special jubilee year of mercy to begin uh, on the 8th of December this year and to run until the 20th of November next year is another indication of that. The way all of this intersects with his approach to interfaith dialogue is I believe that his commitment to mercy means that he is disposed to the most merciful, the most charitable, the most generous possible interpretation of the other. That is, uh, when he encounters a non-Catholic Christian, when he encounters uh, an adherent of another religion, when he encounters an atheist, when he encounters a, a secularist intellectual, whoever it may be, rather than beginning in the first instance with where they disagree and what the problems area are, problem areas are, I believe he is inclined in the first instance uh, to try to find uh, the areas in which they intersect, the, the positive, the, the laudable human values uh, that these people represent that creates a bridge in which relationships become possible. I believe that is an extension, an application, if you like, of his commitment to the gospel of mercy. Okay, that's mercy. Let's talk about friendship for a moment. One of the very distinctive things about Pope Francis's approach both to ecumenism, that is, relationships within the Christian family, and also interfaith dialogue, that is, relationships with other religions, uh, is that his privileged interlocutors uh, are not the supreme leaders, often, uh, of these different traditions. They are, instead, his personal friends. Okay. Who is his go-to guy in the <laughs> Jewish world? Okay. It is not the chief Sephardic or the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Jerusalem. Okay? It's not the head of the American Jewish Congress. It's not the head of the Anti-Defamation League. Who is his bridge in the Jewish world? It's a guy by the name of Rab uh, Rabbi Abraham Skorka, who was the chief rabbi in Buenos Aires during the years that Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio was the chief shepherd of the Catholic community in Argentina. 
Uh, and he got to know Skorka very well, in particular after the infamous bombing of the Jewish Community Center uh, in Argentina. By the way, one of the things you may not know uh, is that unlike many other Latin American nations, Argentina actually has a significant Jewish community. It is the sixth largest Jewish community in the world. Bit of trivia, do you know that Argent Buenos Aires is the only place in the world outside of Israel that has a McDonald's with a kosher menu? Okay. Uh, and Bergoglio you've got to know that community. And when the Jewish Community Center was bombed, uh, he was in the front lines uh, of trying to respond to that. He and Skorka developed a very close personal relationship out of that. Uh, and to this day, uh, Skorka is his go-to guy for insight on developments in, in the wider Jewish world. And he acts as a kind of informal, almost Vatican ambassador with Jewish organizations and Jewish movements and Jewish communities uh, whenever the Pope is interested in something. Who is the Pope's go-to guy in the Islamic world? Once again, uh, it's a guy by the name of Mahmoud Aboud, who was, uh, he is sometimes mistakenly in the press identified as an imam or something. He's not a cleric, he's a layman. Uh, but he was the leader uh, of the Islamic community in Buenos Aires during the years that Bergoglio was there. Uh, and again, any time uh, the Holy Father needs to engage, say, al-Azhar in Egypt, which is sometimes thought of as the Vatican of the Islamic world, uh, or the, the, the seminary in Qom uh, in, uh, in Iraq, uh, which is one of the most uh, respected institutions in the Shia Muslim world and so on, uh, it is usually a Bud that he will call upon uh, to do that. Uh, and why? Not because these are the most renowned or authoritative uh, leaders in their respective traditions, but it is instead because Pope Francis has a bond of friendship with these guys. There's a zone of trust there. Uh, and I think that is illustrative. That, that, or, or to give you another example, when Pope Francis wanted to reach out to the Pentecostal <coughs> tradition in, in, in Christianity, uh, he didn't begin in the first place with the most famous Pentecostal leaders in the world. He called up his old friend Giovanni Tritino, uh, an Italian who had led a Pentecostal community in Argentina for a number of years and then moved back to Italy. He now has a, leads a Pentecostal megachurch outside of Turin. Uh, and Pope Francis recently made a point of going to that community and visiting it and used that occasion to deliver a historic apology for the various ways in which the Catholic Church had mistreated Pentecostals and more broadly uh, Protestant Christians uh, over the years. And again, it came out of that zone of friendship. My point here is that I believe that Pope Francis understands friendship as the magic bullet. Okay? Friendship as the, the, the solution that, uh, that, that can dissolve uh, the, the barriers of division and animosity and misunderstanding. And I believe he thinks there is something quintessentially beautiful about friendship. Let me tell you a quick story that illustrates, to me at least, in my personal experience, that I believe Francis is onto something. This is apropos of the power of friendship to sort of change, to open people up to the other. <clears throat> my wife, some of you in this room know my wife, Shannon. Uh, here's what you need to know about Shannon. First of all, she is Jewish. Uh, and secondly, uh, she's a particular kind of Jew. Uh, I like to think of her as the founder of a fourth strain in American Judaism, which I call Obama Messianism. Okay, she is not waiting for the savior next year in Jerusalem. As far as she's concerned, he is on the job in the White House. And your spiritual duty is to back him up. I mean, take any kind of liberal, feminist, secular stereotype you've got, okay? Prius driving, Birkenstock wearing, whale saving, granola crunching. My wife fits them all, okay, with pride, okay? When, when we moved back from Rome, she moved us into this little, like, blue state, effete enclave uh, outside of Denver called Stapleton. <clears throat> this place, there's, there's a vegetarian eatery she drags me to every Saturday when I'm in town, okay? And ladies and gentlemen, if secular liberalism had a chapel, this is where they would go to worship, <laughs> okay? The way I amuse myself, by the way, come a Saturday morning, uh, is that when Shani drags me there, I will sit at the table in the middle of the room, and in a voice loud enough for everyone to hear, I will say things to her like, honey, you know who gets a bad rap? Dick 
Cheney. There's, there's a really misunderstood guy. You know? The last time I did that, she looked at me and said, well, next Saturday, why don't you just bring your white sheet and burning cross? You know? Anyway, that's my wife for you. So uh, back in 2005, uh, when you remember when the Da Vinci Code was a big cultural phenomenon? Uh, my publisher called me up and said, what we think would be a great idea is for you to do a book on Opus Dei, which is, you know, the controversial sort of conservative Catholic movement that's one of the villains in the Da Vinci Code. <coughs> I thought it was a great idea, mostly because, uh, you know, the paycheck was pretty nice. Uh, so I went to, to Shani and said, hey, uh, we're going to be spending the next year and a half traveling around, uh, you know, seeing Opus Dei all over the world. Now, you can imagine how my liberal Jewish feminist wife felt about that, right? It was like her private idea of hell. Okay, she said, all right, all right, we'll do it. Uh, so we traveled to nine countries, and, uh, you know, the dynamic every place we went was when we would land, I wanted to see three groups of people. I wanted to see the Opus Dei people, I wanted to see the Opus Dei critics, and I just wanted to see the ordinary rank-and-file Catholics to see what they thought about it. Okay. So I would go off and do journalism, but my wife, of course, wanted to play tourist in all of these countries. And ordinarily, the people who would be showing her around turned out, basically every place we went, to be the smart, hip, funny, great, engaging, dynamic, young, female, Opus Dei numeraries or supernumeraries, <laughs> like Opus Dei women. Okay. Uh, and my wife is just totally charmed. She's still Facebook friends with these people. Okay. Uh, and this was eating her up, okay? I mean, I remember when we were in Kenya, one night I went back to our hotel. I had been off all day doing interviews or whatever, and I came back, and she was sitting on the edge of our bed in, like, existential agony, okay? And I said to her, Shani, Shani, what's wrong? She said, it's these Opus Dei people. I mean, I know politically I'm supposed to hate them, but they're just so goddamn nice. <laughs> what am I going to do? You know, uh, and, and the, the, the comedy is that now, you know, anytime I'm at a dinner table with my Catholic friends and Opus Dei comes up, I don't have to say a word. I mean, Shannon will take over the conversation. If people start spouting anti-Opus Dei stereotypes, she will say, hey, you don't know these people. I do. You know, let me tell you what they're really like. Now, catch the point. Was it some kind of syllogism that changed my wife's mind, that opened her up to taking a different look at someone she felt she shouldn't be comfortable with? Was it some convoluted chain of reasoning? Was it an epiphany? No. It was the experience of becoming friends. It was the experience of becoming friends that really is the magic bullet that makes dialogue and relationship and positive engagement possible. And I think that's the intuition that is also at the basis of the Pope's strategy of relying on his friends to introduce him to new friends and thereby to expand the circles of friendship almost indefinitely. Okay? Finally, uh, joy. Uh, joy is, of course, the heart uh, of the document uh, that is basically the Magna Carta of this papacy, Francis's apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, if you go through that document, you will find that joy is the most commonly used substantive noun. It is used a grand total of 139 times. Go check. I'm in the English version, I'm telling you that's true. Uh, and I think joy has obviously become one of the hallmarks of Francis's papacy. I mean, when he appears in public, the man simply exudes a, a kind of pleasure, a, a kind of uh, happiness uh, about being in the presence, uh, in particular, uh, of ordinary people that is just palpable uh, and that communicates well beyond the substance of whatever formal address he's there to give or whatever act he is there to perform. I mean, you see this in multiple ways. You know, uh, when you see him, for example, stopping the Pope Mobile in St. Peter's Square because out of the corner of his eye he has caught sight of a guy who has a genetic skin disorder by the name of Vincenzo Rita, which has left his entire body horribly disfigured with boils. The kind of guy that most of us would cross the street to a, because we would be awkward, we would be uncomfortable if we had to encounter this guy. Uh, instead, Francis hops off the Pope Mobile and makes a beeline for this guy and wraps him in a warm, loving embrace and gives him a kiss on the top of the head. That's not just a faux PR exercise. That is Francis taking genuine pleasure in the ability to be present to someone who, in a particular way, needs him in that moment. Or, for example, when you see him inviting a 16-year-old Italian guy with Down syndrome up onto the Pope Mobile 
to take a swing around St. Peter's Square. That's his own personal joy in action. He's not forcing himself through that. On the contrary, you know, those are the moments in his day he enjoys the most. Or when you see him inviting three homeless guys to join him for his birthday breakfast. Oh, and by the way, it was not just the homeless guys. It was also their dog, uh, whose name is Marley, after the reggae icon Bob Marley. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, Pope Francis is a pope of first in many ways. I guarantee you this is on the list. This was the first time the name Marley had ever been uttered in the precincts of the Vatican. I had the opportunity to interview one of these guys later, and I asked them, did Pope Francis know who Bob Marley is? Okay, and the answer was no, but when we explained it to him, he thought it was cool. <laughs> okay. uh, that's genuine joy. It's delight. Okay, in the presence of other people. To, to me, the, the one moment where the fact that this pope truly does sort of revel uh, in, in just in human contact simpliciature, you know, human contact for the sake of it, where that came home for me uh, was that Brazil trip for World Youth Day. Uh, this is back in July 2013. One of the things that happened during that trip was uh, Pope Francis, of course, inherited that trip from Benedict XVI. It had actually been scheduled for Benedict, but then Benedict resigned, and so Francis said, I'll take the trip. He made uh, only two changes. And, uh, one of them was he wanted to meet with a group of Argentinian youth, Natch. Uh, the other uh, was that he wanted to go to the shrine uh, of Our Lady of Aparecida, which is the national patron of Brazil, uh, probably the second most popular Marian sanctuary in Latin America after Guadalupe and so on, okay? <clears throat> I was in the press pool for that, okay? In the Opera City, he was in Sao Paulo, or in Rio for the, the main event. Uh, Opera City is about, I don't know, 70 kilometers or something outside of uh, Rio. Well, I was in the press pool, so we were in a, in a bus behind the, the papal limo, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, there were huge crowds, you know, all the way around. I mean, you know, uh, Brazil is, of course, the largest Catholic country on earth, at least nominally. It's got a Catholic population of almost 100 million people. So the crowds were astronomic uh, every place the Pope went. But when we actually got to Upper Reseda, okay, we pulled around behind the Basilica, okay, in what was supposed to be a secure zone, right? It was all cordoned off. Right? Uh, it was supposed to be like a safe zone where nobody was there. Okay? But somehow, there was this group of Brazilian nuns who had like wormed their way into this space. Okay? So when the door to the Pope Mobile opens, they start shrieking like teenage girls at a Justin Bieber concert. Okay? They rush the Pope. They're kissing him. They're, they're taking selfies with him. And you know, he's loving every minute of it. All right? <laughs> Now, while all this, now you got to understand that this all was going on like just a month after massive street protests had erupted in Brazil. The country was in flames. Okay, they had allegedly deployed twenty thousand troops and police and security personnel to try to prevent this sort of mob scene from happening. Right, and there was a whole phalanx of these guys just standing by and watching this happening and not doing anything. Okay, so I pulled one of them aside and with my translator I said to him. So why aren't you doing anything? You know, why, why aren't you getting in the way? And this guy, he couldn't have been any more than 21 or 22, right? He says to me, look at me, man. I've got a combat helmet on my head. I've got ammo strapped across my chest. I am not going to be the guy caught on YouTube beating up a nun. <laughs> it just ain't going to happen. <laughs> well, I think that guy sort of inadvertently stumbled across one of the great truths about Pope Francis, which is there is something so electric uh, about this figure, something so appealing about him, that any attempt to bottle it up or fence it in is destined to fail, and therefore, under ordinary circumstances, the better strategy is simply not to try. Now, what is the secret of that appeal? I think the secret is he's not faking it. Okay? He genuinely takes pleasure. He takes real joy in encountering. Okay, uh, encounter with members of his own flock, uh, encounter with members of other Christian traditions, encounters with members of other faiths, uh, encounters with the world in general. Remember that the very first interview he gave his pope, substantive interview he gave his pope, was not with a Catholic journalist, it wasn't with a Christian journalist, uh, it was with a secular atheist. It was with the left-wing founder of the La Repubblica newspaper in Italy, Eugenio Scalfari. 
Uh, and by the way, one of the very, speaking of his commitment to friendship, one of the very interesting things about that is that interview was very explosive because it contained all sorts of things that you would just be shocked to hear a pope say. He talked about God is not a Catholic. I mean, you could just hear the blood pressure of theology departments all across the land going up with that one, right? Uh, and he talked about the, le the Vatican is infected with the leprosy of a royal court. And so it was explosive stuff, okay? Now later, it turned out, okay, that this all had to be walked back a little bit because Scalfrey, who was 90 years old, acknowledged that he went to that conversation with Pope Francis. He did not take notes. He did not tape anything. He went back to his office three days later, sort of tried to reconstruct the conversation from memory and said, I'm not really sure how much of that is me and how much of that is him, okay? <laughs> Footnote to this story is that a few days later, I was in the Santa Marta, which is the residence that Francis lives in in Vatican grounds, and I was talking to a cardinal, one, a member of his G9 Council of Cardinals, his kind of kitchen cabinet, and I said to him, what did you think of that whole scalfery interview, huh? And he said, you know, I felt the same thing, and so I went to the Pope, and I asked him, what about this whole scalfery thing? And he said the Pope's answer was, Ma, sai, lui ormai abbastanza vecchio, dobbiamo essere gentili. Which means, basically, you know, he's kind of old by now. We have to be nice to him. Okay? <laughs> That's his commitment to friendship. I mean, to him, being misquoted was far less important than being able to build a friendship uh, with this person. And again, I think at the bottom of all this is a sense of beauty. Sense of beauty. Okay? That mercy, that friendship, and that joy are all components of beauty. And I think that, in the end, is what Francis is responding to. And I think that, in the end, uh, explains his commitment to dialogue with the other, both the Christian other, the religious other, the secular other, all kinds of others. At the end of the day, I told you I believe Pope Francis is going to be remembered as the Pope of Mercy. But one of the things that is going to get him there is that he is also the Pope of Encounter, the Pope of Encounter. Uh, and so for the project that you're engaged in during these days in this conference, I would suggest to you that you have no better, pope, no better point of reference uh, than Pope Francis. Uh, and although I'm not entirely sure, although I do know that, that Francis is a big Peter Casarella fan, but I, I don't know uh, if he actually knows this conference is taking place. But if he did, I guarantee you it would have his enthusiastic, wholehearted, and full support. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. God bless you. God bless Notre Dame. And Viva Il Papa. <laughs>
there was a Senate of Bishops that year, and for the life of me, I can't even remember what it was. But what I remember uh, is that then Archbishop Ed Egan of New York was going to be the relator, which is like the presiding chairman of the Senate. Uh, and if you know Ed Egan at all, one of the things you would know about him is that he absolutely hated the media. I mean, just hated it. Uh, no one would have been happier if he never had to do another interview. But uh, on this rare occasion, he had decided to grant me an interview. So we had set up this appointment to have an interview okay, in Rome. However, uh, he had gotten Rome in two, for the Senate. Two days later, 9-11 happens. Okay, now he's the Archbishop of New York, just as not, you can imagine. Okay, so he obviously had to go home. He couldn't stick around for the Senate. He had to go back to be with his people. So he calls me up, okay, and he says, John, listen. Uh, I know we had an appointment for an interview, um, but I'm going to have to go back. I'm sure you understand. But I've talked to the guy who's taking over for me, and he said he doesn't like doing interviews either, but um, he would be willing to do it because I already had this commitment. I said, okay, great. Who is it? He said, well, it's this archbishop named Bergoglio from Argentina. I said, okay. I'd never heard of the guy before. I said, all right, that's fine. Um, now, you can, I mean, I'm an American reporter, you know, overseas, two days after 9-11. What do I care about the Archbishop of Argentina, right? I've got bigger fish to fry. But, you know, Egan was going out of his way, so it's okay, that's great. Anyway, so uh, he said, okay, so he's agreed to meet you at the Santa Marta, which now, of course, is where he lives on Vatican grounds. You know, back then, it was like a hotel for visiting dignitaries who were coming from the Vatican, right? So he's agreed to meet you at the Santa Marta on such and such a day at such and such a time. So, okay, great. So I show up for our appointment. Now you gotta understand, if you've ever been in the, in the Doma Santa Marta, what happens is when you go in, there are these like smoky glass doors, right? And you go in and they slide open. And then there's a spiral staircase on either side that you go down and then you go up to like the reception desk. And you say, I am here to see his excellency so-and-so. And then they call up to his room. Uh, and his aide comes on from the phone and says, well, his excellency is very busy, but, you know, he will be down shortly. And then they put you into a little room. Uh, and then maybe 10 or 15 minutes th later, the flunky comes down to, like, make sure everything's copacetic. Uh, and then, you know, 10 or 15 minutes after that, his nibs actually comes down. Okay, so it's usually a huge protocol. So that day, when I'm supposed to meet for Golio, I walk in and these, these sliding glass doors open and there's a little guy in clerical black sitting on a folding chair, just inside the door, okay? Uh, and he looks up to me and he says, um, are you Alan? And I said, uh, yeah, um, I'm here to meet Archbishop Bergoglio. And he's like, well, I'm Bergoglio. <laughs> okay, um, where do you want to talk? And he says, well, we could probably just get another chair. And I'm like, you really don't get how this works. Do you? <laughs> because, you know, you're an archbishop. All you got to go down, all you got to do is go down and tell them you want a room. They're going to give you a room. And I says, well, if you, I said, well, probably, because people are going to be coming and going. Maybe that would be better, right? So, you know, we go downstairs, and one of these guys in, like, the white tuxedos, you know, comes up. And I say, his excellency would like to have a, a room to have a kind of, oh, of course, you know. So they take us over to this room, and they turn on some lights. And then Bergoglio says, would you like a coffee? I'll get you a coffee. And I'm like, again, you really don't get the deal, do you? Okay, because all you gotta do is tell these guys and they'll bring it in on a silver tray, you know? And so all I'm saying is that was my one, you know, uh, sort of hard and fast experience with Bergoglio, which, which means that I can tell you for sure that the humble, simple thing you're seeing now is not an act, it was the guy before and it's the same guy, same guy now. Um, and now I've forgotten which story I was actually starting to tell you at the very beginning of all of this. Huh? Why he's drawn to ugliness. Like oh, ugliness. Yes, thank you. The, the story I was going to tell you is about him and the vicious miserius. Well, I went down there after his election because, frankly, to be honest with you, this to me, this whole idea of the Pope of the slums, you know, the great lover of the poor, to me it sounded like hagiography, <coughs> right? It sounded like PR. I was a little skeptical of it, to be honest. Um, and, and so I went down there and I went to one of the vicious. Vicious, by the way, the poor in these places are so anonymous. They don't. The, the, these neighborhoods don't even have names. They just have numbers. Uh, so this was vicious twenty one, uh, which is uh, it's where our la the the Virgin Our Lady of Kakupe uh, Parish is located, uh, which is one of the famous parishes in in the poor neighborhoods of Buenos Aires. Anyway, uh, the pastor there, a guy by the name of Juan Isis Mendes. Uh, I was talking to him, and I said to him, look, and we, we had kind of established a, a pretty good relationship, and so I said to him, look, just tell me the truth. 
Okay, this whole thing about Bergoglio spending all his time here and being the great lover of the poor, I'm sure the guy's heart is in the right place, but you know, how much of that is just manufactured, you know, stuff, right? Uh, and he says to me, he said, listen, don't take my word for it. Go out on the street and ask them. Just go out, stop people at random and ask. I had a translator with me, so, you know, we, we walked out into the street and we stopped about six or seven people, totally at random. And I said, listen, just what can you tell me about the new pope? You know, what can you tell me about this guy, Bergoglio? Do you know what they all did? All did. Before they even verbalized a response, they ran back into these tin shacks or wooden shacks that they called home. And they grabbed a prized photo that showed Bergoglio baptizing their children or confirming their nephews or sitting in their living room when their husband died consoling them because that's where he spent his time. That parish, a version of Kakupe, actually, the week after Bergoglio's election, had a mass at Thanksgiving for the election of the Pope, and they encouraged people to bring their pictures. Everyone in that church had a picture. I've seen a photo of them holding their photos. It looks like a human photo op. I mean, it's truly astonishing. Okay. So his, my point is, his commitment is real. Okay. Now, how do we explain the paradox? that a man who clearly does have a very keen sense of beauty, I mean, this is a guy growing up who, you know, danced the tango and he read Schopenhauer and he went to the movies of Fellini and so on. He has a very fine aesthetic sense. Okay, how do we explain the paradox that he was so drawn to these places which objectively would seem to us quite ugly? I think the explanation is he has such a fine aesthetic sense that he sees the beauty beneath that apparent ugliness. You know, I think what he sees is the unadorned humanity the unpretentious humanity uh, of people in those settings, uh, which in him awakens a sense of the kind of, the surprise of beauty. You know that famous essay by C.S. Lewis, Surprised by Joy. I think Ber you know, Bergoglio would say we need to be surprised by beauty. We need to be open to the possibility that beauty may fall upon us uh, in the places we would least expect it. Uh, and you know, when he talks about the peripheries, Right? I mean, this is very much a pope at the peripheries. That's one of his favorite words, right? He's always calling the church to go to the peripheries. I, I, I suspect if you asked him, I don't think anyone has quite asked him this question directly, but uh, I think he would probably tell you that his favorite place to go looking for beauty is precisely at the periphery. One or two Ego te absolvo. <laughs> yeah, twice I met Bergoglio twice before being pope, etc. My husband knows him much better than I do. But um, what I notice when we go to Argentina is he's very criticized in Argentina. Yeah, yeah, very much. The only place yeah. where he is criticized and because of his political um, positions or something that the Argentinians think they are the political positions. I would like to know if you if if you perceive that in him and if you find this critic elsewhere than in Argentina. Well, I mean, first of all, no prophet is without honor is with honor in his own yeah. land, right? I mean that's a scriptural insight. Uh, you know, it is true. I mean listen, you know, the, the young, very talented Catholic journalist that we hired to work for us at Crux in Argentina from Rosario, which as you know is the second city of Argentina. Mm -hmm. She tells me that her mother very pious Catholic mother. Her mother, when Bergoglio was elected, wept, not out of joy, but out of despair. Okay, because in her mind, Bergoglio was all about, you know, the poor and nothing about, you know, the gospel. You know, I mean, in other words, he was political and not spiritual. That's how she said. So sure, I mean, that criticism, I, I, I'm echoing. I know that the criticism you're talking about. Uh, you ask, is it elsewhere? <laughs> hey, lady, we're in the United States, yeah. Uh, you know, there is some blowback against uh, Pope Francis here as well. Uh, you know, there, there would be blowback against the Pope in um, some conservative sectors of Catholic opinion that would be alarmed by his doctrinal statements, by his liturgical practices, uh, by what they would perceive as a kind of softness when it comes to the pro-life positions of the church. Uh, there was blowback in secular circles uh, in this country, uh, particularly what we would conventionally think of as more conservative political sectors of opinion that would object to uh, his positions on climate change, uh, his rhetoric on, on capitalism, uh, his position on immigration, and on and on. 
So, I mean, sure, there's criticism of the Pope, but can I say this? Uh, you know, I've covered three Popes. There has been blowback and resistance to every Pope I have covered. I mean, there was enormous blowback to John Paul II. There was ferocious, and in my opinion, extremely mean-spirited and vicious resistance to Pope Benedict uh, in, in many circles. And as a historian, as an amateur historian, uh, I can tell you it's not just these three guys. I mean, this has been the story of the papacy from the very beginning. You know, Francis is the 266th pope, and I think he's the 266th pope to have faced opposition from somewhere. I mean, the story goes all the way back to the New Testament, right? And Paul getting in the face of Peter. I mean, so, uh, you know, in that sense, there's nothing new under the sun. I do not necessarily believe that the resistance to Francis uh, is any more dramatic or any more pronounced uh, than, uh, certainly in my experience, the other two popes with whom I am personally familiar. The only difference is it, it is coming from slightly different quarters. Uh, and if I may say, there is a certain hypocrisy afoot uh, in, in some quarters of the church these days, and I think it's on both sides. Um, you know, liberal Catholics during the John Paul years, when they saw a bishop standing up to the Pope, they would call him prophetic and courageous. Now when they see a bishop standing up to the Pope, they call him disobedient and disloyal. Well, I'm sorry, you know, but you can't have both, okay? Uh, and, you know, similarly, in conservative quarters, I remember during the John Paul years, anybody who would dare say, or the Benedict years, you know, anybody who would dare say a critical word about the Pope was borderline heretical, right? Uh, and now, you know, they're a modern-day um, St. Jerome, you know, standing up against the Athanasian heresy, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, on both sides, uh, you know, there is a certain double standard afoot, uh, which suggests, in my opinion, that quite often the people who dominate public conversation uh, in the church, and I think this may be particularly true of the states, although to some degree it's true everywhere, but certainly in the states, People who dominate public conversation in the church, quite often, what is most fundamental for them uh, is their political ideology rather than the gospel, right? Um, I mean, you know, we purport to be evangelizers of culture. Quite often, we are thoroughly evangelized by it, uh, and this ideological tribalism may be the leading case in Well, thank you for your wonderful taste and rhetoric. <laughs> How do you see the future of the ecumenical relationship between Catholic Church and Orthodox Churches with Pope Francis? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, obviously, Pope Francis has, has made a priority to, out of outreach to the Orthodox, beginning in the first instance, of course, with the Patriarch of Constantinople. I mean, you know, these day, in, in Rome, jokingly, we say that these days, Francis and Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople are like BFFs, you know? I mean, they just, they don't do anything without each other. Uh, and they're constantly sending one another love notes. I mean, there's a, definitely a bromance going on in the country, okay? Um, a, and, and so clearly, you know, Francis is committed, okay, to try to moving the ball. Uh, and I think there, there certainly are encouraging signs. I mean, uh, you know, the fact, for example, that he is much more likely to call himself the Bishop of Rome, the Supreme Pontiff, plays very well uh, in Orthodox circles. Uh, the fact that he always refers to Bartholomew as Carlo Andrea, meaning my dear Andrew, recognizing him as the successor of Andrew in the same way that the Pope is the successor of Peter, plays very well uh, in Orthodox circles. Um, however, uh, let me, let's do a brief reality check, okay? Uh, you know, there was no doubt that uh, if the future of Catholic Orthodox relations were entirely in the hands of Francis and Bartholomew, we, we would be much further down the line. The truth of it is, however, that in the Orthodox world, Bartholomew is a figurehead. He is an important figurehead, but he doesn't have any sociological following. Okay, and this is in part a conscious policy of the Turkish government over the last hundred years to try to suck all the oxygen uh, out of the patriarchate of Constantinople. But in any event, the point is, you know, the number of people that he actually has on the ground, by our standards, would be a large parish. Okay, that's his following. The 800-pound gorilla in the Orthodox world is the patriarch of Moscow. Okay, it's the Russian Orthodox Church. Two-thirds of the 275 million Orthodox Christians uh, in the world belong to the Patriarchate of Moscow, okay, and, and all Russia. 
Uh, and there, the ecumenical attitudes are much, much more hawkish, uh, I think would be fair to say. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, Peter, I know you, you want to pull the plug on this, but do, do you mind if I, have two minutes, I'll tell you one last story, and I swear to God, this is the last <laughs> bit of papal lore I will give you. But uh, just to illustrate this point about the attitudes in Moscow, uh, in 2002, uh, John Paul II wanted to return a very precious Russian Orthodox icon called the icon of the Madonna of Kazan. Okay? Uh, and I'll spare you the details of how this ended up in John Paul's position. It is possession. It's a very weird, <laughs> almost surreal story. Uh, but anyway, John Paul ended up with this icon and he wanted to send it. And he had been hoping for a long time, because he got it in the early 90s, he had been hoping that he would be able to return it to Russia personally. Okay, but then it became clear by 2002 that the Russians just were never going to let John Paul onto Russian soil. Okay, so he decided to send it back and he commissioned this delegation. Okay, which was led by the Secretary of State and the founder of San Egidio and a bunch of other people, okay, to take this icon back to the Patriarchate of Moscow. Footnote to the story, oh, and Cardinal Walter Casper, who was the Pope's top ecumenical office at the time, was also in this delegation. Okay. Footnote to the story, um, the day I went to cover it, this was not a papal trip, so most of the Vatican press corps didn't go, there were only two of us. Okay. Uh, and the night before we got there, the, papal, the, the Vatican spokesperson called me up and said, John, um, listen, we can't get you credentials because the, the, the Kremlin won't give press credentials. So basically what we're going to do is list you as part of our delegation. So just show up at our hotel tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning and get in the van with us and you can go in with us. I said, okay, great. So I ended up in the van next to Walter Casper who had the icon of Kazan in this huge oak chest on his lap. Okay, and as we're pulling into the Kremlin, Casper turns to me and says, this thing is heavy, would you mind holding it for a while? And I said, not at all, Cardinal, and so he gives it to me as we pull into the Kremlin. So, for, for the historical record, if anyone ever asks you who returned the icon of Kazan to the Russian Orthodox, <laughs> I did, because it was on my lap when we pulled in. Uh, anyway, we get there, there's this four-hour liturgy, okay, where the patriarch of Moscow is, you know, doing whatever, uh, and it goes on and on. Uh, and we have to sit there through this whole four-hour thing, and at the end, when it comes time to return the icon to him, you know what they do? They turn off the microphones inside the basilica so no one can hear. They turn off the TV camera so no one can see. Uh, and as soon as the ceremony is over, the spokesperson for the patriarch runs outside and says, none of this means anything until they, until they stop proselytizing in the Ukraine. Okay, so my point is uh, that it is a very difficult long term. There are historical and theological and political resentments there. They're going to take a long time to work through. Some of them are on our side. I, I, I actually believe even more of them uh, are on the side of the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox in particular. I think Francis's approach in, in the first instance is about forging uh, friendships, but beyond that, uh, and this is something Sporka says. Sporka gave a very interesting talk at the Gregorian uh, a few months ago about Francis's attitude towards interfaith relationship. And I think it's also true about his approach to ecumenism. Which is he said, there is a, Sporka, this is Rabbi Sporka, the Pope's Jewish friend, said there is a distinctive Latin American approach to this kind of dialogue, which focuses less on the lessons of the past and more on the imperatives of the present. That is, what we're interested in is not so much picking through who was responsible for the Crusades or you know, who did what to whom, uh, but we're more interested in, you know, we're living through an economic crisis, we're living through bone crushing poverty, we're living through a natural disaster, we're living through the legacy of war. What can we do together to try to address that? All right, so it's a very pragmatic, here and now, activity-oriented model uh, of ecumenism. Uh, and I, I do think you see that reflected in Francis's approach. I think he is much less interested in the traditional ecumenical goal of full structural communion, okay, than he is the practical question of how can we pool resources in the here and now, because I think his conviction is that if we do that often enough, then full structural communion eventually will follow, right? In other words, it's the, it, is a, it is a model that is both practical and friendship-oriented as opposed to structural and doctrine, right? I think that's his distinctive touch. Is that it? Can I say one last thing before I leave? Um, I want this to be the beginning of our conversation rather than the end. 
so let me just say this. If there is ever any way that I can be of help to someone in this room, uh, I have no idea on God's earth what that would mean, uh, but um, you know, if you are in a seminar someplace and some Vatican question comes up you think I might be able to help with, or I don't know, you know you're looking for a contact or a suggestion, Okay, if you're coming to Rome and you want restaurant recommendations, okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is where I really shine, okay, you know, whatever it is, uh, if I can be of help. Um, I write for, as Peter said, uh, Crux, which is a website of the Boston Globe. The, the website is www.cruxnow, C-R-U-X, cruxnow.com. My email address is at the bottom of all of my articles. Uh, and I do respond to that. Now, if you're going to do that, please put Notre Dame or Peter or something in the subject line. So I don't think, forgive me, Paul Lannis, so I don't think you're the eighth Nigerian prince today who's going to give me 80 million bucks if I just give him my credit card information. Okay. Uh, but assuming you get through my spam filter, uh, if I can be of help to you, I would be delighted to do that. Okay. So please do take advantage of it. Thank you.